Okay, and we are now recording. New kitty. All right, hello. This is a ECAC meeting, and uh, we have a lot on the agenda today. So let's go ahead and and get started. Um, first thing on the schedule is to look at the. Uh, well, first thing is to find a recorder. So. Let's see, last time it was Jesse, and <clears throat> I know, Don, if you're up to it, I know we're, I know you have to leave a little early, so we're going to end this meeting today at that point. Um, are you okay to take notes, or? Yeah, I'm, um, yeah, I'm happy to. I, I'm, I'm sorry I do have to leave at 6.15, but that's. That's okay. Yeah. We're okay. all exhausted. It sounds like we're all going to benefit from that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have much to say anyway, so I'll just write. It's okay. Good. Okay. Um, all right. So in that case, are there any comments? I can share the I can share the minutes if anybody wants me to. Here, I'll just do it. Uh, share. And if there are any comments. Uh, we accepted the minutes. We had an update. I didn't see anything that I needed to change. I thought these were actually really nice notes. So thank you. I think it was Jesse, right? Maybe I could add just one thing under section six, ECAC member updates. Yep, go ahead. The roof gave a presentation, just add at the Hitchcock Center to eight people. Okay, you got that, Stephanie? I do. All right. I'll Thank you. <clears throat> anything else? If there's nothing else, is there a move to accept the minutes? I'll move to accept the minutes. Second. I'll second that, Steve Roof. All right. And um, please be sure you are unmuted and on camera. Goldner. Yes. Allison. Yes. Roof. Yes. D. Yes. Gregor. Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved. Okay, great. Onward then. Um, next on the agenda is always public comment. Do we have any public here today? We do. We do. Martha, if you Martha. want to say anything. Martha. Martha, got anything for us today? Here. Martha, you can go in ahead and unmute even if you don't have anything to say, just to say hello. <laughs> okay, I'll say hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so um, on to updates. Uh, let's start with uh, transportation, Stella. Uh, no, I haven't written the letters yet. After, that'll be an after finals thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think but that's... I did pass my comprehensive exams. So now I'm a PhD candidate. Yeah, I understand. This is the, for several of us, this is the end of the semester. And uh, it's been a really hectic uh, few weeks. So, um, but I am looking forward to getting that. Um, uh, that letter and the anti idling letter. That's actually you're actually on the schedule twice then as as update and as five. So we'll just we'll come back to that next time then. So should we? Yeah, you can that. Okay. okay. Um. Okay. So, uh, Don, anything on pace? Uh, I I I'm not in academia, but in my business, the end of the year is awful, absolutely awful. Yeah. With how many clients are trying to close deals and something about the tax code, I think, is driving <laughs> most everything. So the answer is no, like okay. um, Stella. All right. But that has started. We we have a yes. I think we have a pace program now. So next year. We do. We do. Next year, that's something for us to definitely jump into. And, um, and I have fallen down on the job on contacting um, Stephanie to reach out to 
um, the appropriate people. So okay, cool. It's on me. That's okay. Um, slow but steady progress. Uh, okay, solar bylaw draft. We have a draft. I admit I have not had time to read it. Uh, it is long. So, Dwayne, do you have a? I understand you have some powerpoints for us. I do have not not not. I, believe me, I didn't go overboard, but um, I did just to help um, organize and and uh, moderate this discussion. I put together a short PowerPoint with I think some salient points to get a, to to help sort of uh, put this in context and then um, sort of highlight some of the key areas of the bylaw. Uh, and then we have in the packet the bylaw, it's the draft bylaw itself, yep. as well as the um, transmittal um, memo from the working group to the town manager uh, that provides a fair amount of context as well. So we can reference those, uh, but I can um, go through the PowerPoint and use that to um, uh, bring forward uh, sort of where, where we're at and what, what sort of what's it in the bylaw. Um, so if that's okay, uh, that sounds, share screen. Yeah, that sounds great. Go ahead and just let's keep in mind that the, if I remember right, the time scale for this is that we need to have feedback sort of end of January, early February or no? So. No, um, no. So this, uh, the process is that it goes to the council and they will refer it to CRC. Um, and then that'll be an opportunity for comment. So, and it won't be coming to you specifically. No, I know that, but the time scale for when we should have our, if we're gonna have comments. It's just that if, I mean, you can, I think what we decided at the last meeting was certainly that you could work on your comments now, but there's no, you don't have an absolute deadline, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay. There's no pressure. It's re really highly unlikely that they're gonna come anywhere near any kind of a decision-making in January. Okay. So I'm just saying that if you, you know, there's no pressure, there's no absolute right. pressure. But it's nice to have a time to aim for to have our discussion wrapped up. So mm -hmm. maybe late Jan, maybe early February or something like that. We should yeah. sort of and and certainly on this draft, but they may make I mean they may make changes. Right. They may not make changes. I mean I really don't I, I don't I think we were asking them to sort of take a look. And there have been two recent decisions on the Pelham and the Shootsbury solar bylaws that um, because technically we're a city, so we actually won't have our bylaw reviewed by the attorney general. However, um, those decisions certainly play into how the legal framework works. And um, I would think that when our legal counsel reviews our solar bylaw draft at whatever point it goes to them, that they will certainly reference these decisions in terms of looking at, at ours and what they think may or may not be potentially problematic. So I'm not aware of those decisions. What what transpired yeah, there? I was going to maybe that. reference yeah. them in the discussion sure. too, because I think they're really uh, quite relevant. I, I uh, I'm no lawyer, <laughs> okay, at good. All. Uh, but I think uh, I think <laughs> our stands uh, is distinct from Pelham and Shootsbury in in sort of the issues that were raised by the AG uh, office. Um, right. That being said. Um, the AG is looking at this very carefully and and um, with a critical lens with regard to fitting into the um, Dover Amendment, as it's called, which I'll get to in a moment. Okay, go ahead then. All right. All right. So does that look like a PowerPoint to you? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I have a couple of slides just on giving some background on this and then a couple of slides that go into sort of what the content or some of the key sections are, uh, not in detail, but just sort of section headings of some of the key con uh, key sections. And then uh, one slide, I think, each on particularly how the working group and the draft bylaw addresses um, issues with regard to solar on in forest on forest land and solar on farmland, uh, which is not at all the extent of what we looked at, but uh, is uh, areas that were discussed and, and certainly are of interest. I think the area of, of uh, sort of the protection of drinking water is another area that I can I can touch on. Um, okay, so um, 
Oh, isn't that advancing? Oh, there we go. So uh, this this is, um, you know, er, as we started this working group, um, we had um, several, but uh, an initial meeting with the town council, um, legal council, um, to really carefully review the laws that we have to work under. Uh, and primarily, this is uh, the, the state context. Here's the Mass General Law, Chapter 40. A section three referred to as the Dover Amendment. Um, and the Dover Amendment itself is not specific to solar, but it's specific uh, with regard to um, limiting the authority of municipalities to regulate zoning on, uh, for certain protected or exempted uses, um, including these, these, th these things listed here, agriculture, religious use, education, et cetera, childcare, uh, and solar. Uh, is uh, enumerated specifically in that list as well. Um, there is some thought and discussion that this was um, put forward in the maybe 80s or 90s when it was more with regard to protecting ability for homeowners and building owners to put solar on their buildings or nearby their buildings. Uh, but it preve prevails uh, to this very day uh, with regard to um, larger scale solar development and and uh, the the um, uh, limiting the authority of municipalities to to zone uh, in any way that would would uh, unduly um, limit um, uh, solar development uh, at at all scales um, in uh, in in Massachusetts uh, and so the specific language with regard to to um, solar in this section is in the highlight there that says no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. And so um, that's pretty explicit. Uh, the first part of that's quite explicit. Uh, uh, no bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate solar installations. The second part with regard to except where necessary to protect public health, safety, and well welfare is I think where um, there is um, potentially wiggle room, but also um, where very strict um, interpretation of that has been demonstrated by the attorney general's office particularly now with Shutesbury and Pelham, uh, where there has been um, rejections essentially of language in those bylaws that have recently uh, been put forward to the AG's office for review um, with the some of the provisions uh, that um, specifically do regulate uh, and in the AG's case un unduly. Um, and the arguments that have been made <clears throat> with regard to protecting public health, safety, and welfare have not, have at least fallen flat um, with regard to the AG's office review of those, <clears throat> um, those um, uh, bylaws that have been put forward or, or draft bylaws that have been put forward. Uh, so that was the context that we were working under. And I think it was very clear uh, in messaging from the town legal council that um, Public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, while that did give rationale, could be could be used for rationale. Uh, there had to be very clear um, justification and tying uh, any specific regulation or restriction on solar development to these things: health, safety, and welfare. Um, but just to clarify, we're not considered a municipality, we're considered a town, so somehow this is different for us, or is it the same? Well, we're a municipality, I guess, I, and that was new to me, we're a city, I guess that was the new structure of the government now, uh, but uh, but municipality, it, it, my, my understanding, municipality is, incorporates both cities and towns. Okay, so this does apply to Amherst as well. Yeah, as this well. applies to Amherst. Uh, apparently, the AG office doesn't need to review our bylaw, which I, I, I wasn't aware of. Oh, but, but they don't need to review it. I but see. it still so. needs to... Uh, it still needs to meet these um, the state law, right? Because what will happen is it'll be challenged in court. Yeah, yeah. Although exactly. although we don't need to get AG approval, somebody could bring a lawsuit saying uh, our bylaw violates this statute. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and part of it is that towns have automatic review of their bylaws by the attorney general's office. Cities right. do not. And yeah. Amherst is a town, is a city known as the town of Amherst. <laughs> okay. All right. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, that's good. I don't just for additional background, um, we had a great uh, working group. Um, really um, honored to, to 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 meet these people and work with these people. Uh, keep in mind, four of the members members were specifically um, designated to be represent committees within the town. Uh, Janet McGowan from the planning committee, sorry, planning board. Myself from ECAC. Uh, Laura Pagli Arulo um, from the Conservation Commission, and I might add also that Laura brought wonderful um, expertise as a solar developer herself uh, to the to the um, team or the working group, and then Jack Jemsick from Water Supply Protection Committee, and then um, unaffiliated unaffili members unaffiliated with other other committees were selected by the town manager as well including um, Martha Hanner, who's with us uh, today and has joined many ECAC calls as well, uh, Bob Rooks and Dan Corcoran. Um, I was selected to chair the by the working group at the beginning and Martha served as the vice chair and was, was uh, selected as vice chair. And so um, appreciate not only um, meeting Martha, uh, uh, but also her um, leadership on this as well. Okay, um, to get going, we did um, make good use of um, existing bylaws that were either model bylaws or some some written bylaws um, to help us uh, sort of uh, think about the scope and and language uh, of the bylaw. The planning uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has a solar best practices guide, which has a very uh, useful um, guideline for solar bylaws specifically that was um, uh, was was uh, reviewed and, and used uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, DOER itself has a has a model solar bylaw. Uh, we found that the Cape Cod Commission model um, large for large scale solar uh, bylaw was quite applicable and useful. And then we also referenced and um, tracked ongoing recent and ongoing um, bylaws that had been. Um, passed by their towns, not necessarily approved by the AGs yet, uh, but in Athol and Shootsbury particularly, uh, given their proximity, um, especially. Um, the the bylaw, um, you know, it, it uh, was about 20 pages or so. Um, it has, as a, as a good regulation or bylaw, it's, it's broken down into different sections, uh, appropriately enumerated and so forth. Uh, there's some sort of administrative ones in terms of um, definitions and stuff like that. But some of the key ones um, for us to keep in mind, and we can reference the bylaw itself to look at some of the detail here as needed. Uh, but it's the, the uh, bylaw starts off with some nexus statements around forest, particularly around forest land and farmland, the purpose of those nexus statements is really to um, demonstrate um, uh, or to put forward values uh, of that are incorporated in these bylaws um, with regard to, to help defend, if you will, uh, any regulations that are forthcoming in the, or any restrictions that are forthcoming in the regulations with regard to public health, safety, and welfare uh, to set up your justification uh, for these issues uh, in these nexus statements so that when there are um, some restrictions in all zoning is to some extent some restrictions, um, uh, that there is some basis for that uh, uh, um, referencing in terms of its impact on public health, safety, and welfare. So those are those are sort of starting off sort of broad statements. It also uh, very clearly states um, the position of Amherst with regard to addressing the climate emergency. Um, there's a whole list of submit, submittal requirements uh, that applicants would need to submit to the town. Um, and... Um, um, we can go through those, but they're pretty cookie cutter, but some are more specific maybe to solar. Um, there's a whole set of design standards uh, with regard to um, 
uh, the the uh, design of the array and the uh, layout and so forth. Uh, and let me also just back up and say, the bylaw, the applicability of the bylaw is to arrays in 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 Amherst that are uh, equal to or over 250 kW. Uh, so this is about an acre in size, uh, but 250 kW. That's what this bylaw is about. Other smaller projects would not be subject to this bylaw, and and that would include um, essentially um, building mounted building system building uh, 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 building mounted systems or parking canopies, for example. Um, the special requirements, um, which I'll go to in a little bit more detail uh, with regard to installations in forest land um, and on farmland. Um, there's a section about maximizing ecosystem services of the um, of a uh, array design uh, designed with regard to the um, land around it and and between the arrays to to uh, use that area um, to max maximize to the extent possible ecosystem services. There's a short section on battery energy storage systems. Um, keep in mind all of these projects 250 and over will by definition uh, or by regulation by the state uh, require some degree of on-site battery energy or energy storage. Uh, and so there is a short section with regard to that. That being said, it's a relatively short section that is, um, uh, it, there's a separate bylaw that um, Christine Brestrup um, and her department are working on um, specifically for battery energy storage, uh, be it um, standalone or uh, within a solar system. Um, there's a section on stormwater management and erosion control and sedimentation, sedimentation control. Uh, this is a specific issue, not not um, somewhat during operation, but primarily with regard to the con the, the construction phase and the early operation phase between the, before the land um, growth and vegetation vegetative growth may might be fully established. Um, and um, as with any construction project. Um, um, sedimentation control and, and erosion is very important, uh, particularly also with regard to um, um, stormwater management, uh, particularly as we see um, more frequent and, and more uh, severe rainfalls. Um, and, and certainly there's been some, um, a few projects that have run into uh, problems with regard to erosion control that were not well um, uh, controlled in this manner. Uh, there's a section on protection of drinking water supplies um, that address both public water drinking supplies, which are our big reservoirs and, and wells, uh, but also a section that deals specifically with um, more um, uh, personal or, or, or individual wells um, that we have, particularly in, in uh, North, North Amherst. Um, and then uh, there, there's a, a section on abandonment and, and decommissioning. Um, of the of these arrays. All right, and then and this is not all the sections. There's some other sections. I just didn't um, feel like some of them weren't that critical for us to. Um, I didn't think was critical to put in front of you. Okay, um, so just two one slide each. I think on on forest land and farmland with regard to how the working group came out uh, with regard to our recommendations in this draft bylaw on dealing with uh, solar in these two areas. Um, so for forest land, and, and do keep in mind that um, uh, there's already uh, significant amounts of forest land um, in, in Amherst that is off limits to solar uh, because it's in um, protected status it's conservation land uh, and so forth. So that land is already off the table. Uh, this is land that would is not that is not protected in that way, uh, but could be open to solar development. Uh, so um, um, for uh, for the, for forest land, um, for um, those lands that are designated per per uh, Massachusetts uh, maps. Um, as core habitat or crit critical natural landscapes, um, or as priority habitat or estimated habitat as defined by the Endangered Species Act, Massachusetts, 
Um, those are off, off limits to forest clearing um, on those lands. Um, for other forest land, um, there's not any prohibition, uh, but there are setbacks uh, for clearings that are over five acres. Uh, and these setbacks are uh, um, lo longer or deeper um, uh, than what we had for setbacks in non-forest land, which was 50 feet. Um, for uh, for forest land, there would be a hundred foot buffer of uncleared land uh, shall be maintained between the solar array and any public roads or residential property lines. Uh, for non-forest, it's it's really fifty feet. Um, so that's where we um, ended up, really, on forest land. Um, on farmland, and let me just finish this, and then we'll we'll, we'll discuss to your heart's content. Um, on uh, farmland, um, our goal was really to um, maintain active and productive farm land in farming, um, recognizing that there's pressures to um, take farming out of farmland out of farming and develop it for other reasons. Uh, and solar can actually provide opportunities for farmers to be able to maintain farming uh, by having additional revenue sources. Um, um, now this is not applicable uh, for all farmland, but for farmland that is, and there's a, a decent amount of this in Amherst, uh, for, farm, for, for land that is categorized as prime farmland or farmland of statewide importance, and there's maps designating this, uh, it, it has to do with the soils. Um, uh, and which ha which uh, is being which is currently being actively farmed or has been actively farmed in the last five years uh, for any solar array that is over five acres. Uh, so this is not applicable if a farmer wants to put a, a relatively small array somewhere on their farm. Uh, but for any larger ar array, five acres over five acres, it must be designed as an agrivoltaic, uh, also known as a dual use uh, solar project. Uh, also known as an agrivoltaic solar um, generation solar unit uh, per the SMART program uh, and must meet the uh, criteria, the definition of the that those terms uh, that the state has, which are robust in nature. Um, uh, now, we did provide an out. Uh, it, it's hard to require, make a requirement uh that, that's that's uh 100 percent um uh we did provide a, an out that um, if an applicant can demonstrate that for some reason an agrivoltaic system is technically or financially infeasible um, based on some third party specialist analysis uh then the town um uh um can can provide them an exemption uh, to this requirement. Uh, that being said, agrivoltaics are being built now. Uh, there's there's tech the technologies there, um, uh, and I I, I think we, while we would want to maintain that um, exemption, um, there would be it would be a fairly high bar. Uh, so the idea is that if a farm does a, a farm in prime farmland prime soils and so forth. Uh, and that is being actively farmed, wants to move forward with solar, they need to do it as an agrivoltaic array, which means that they maintain their farmland in productive agriculture, along with the solar array. Um, uh, there's also provisions with regard to soil management, um, uh, particularly with regard to farmland. Um, this is... Um, to some extent also required by DOER in their agrivoltaic uh, program and so forth, but we wanted to make that explicit uh, as well. Um, and so for all such lands, meaning prime farmland or farmland of statewide importance, um, and regardless of whether um, active farming has been there or not, uh, those soils uh, shall be managed and conserved uh, so that the land remains suitable for far future farming activities. Um, and there's um, provisions within the bylaw that provides a set of soil conservation and management requirements 
um, along with reporting requirements for agrivoltaic arrays, uh, which is not meant to be burdensome, um, but um, uh, but basically that uh, the applicant would need to also provide the reporting that they need to provide. They need to provide anyhow to DOER to the state if they're qualified as an agrivoltaic array, that that reporting is also provided to the town. That reporting uh, demonstrates um, that the farm is being maintained in active farming, uh, along with other things. Uh, so I think that's what I have in terms of the, um, yeah, that was this last slide. Uh, so let me, um, uh, happy to happy to dig into any of those other sections uh, in more detail, any of these sections, uh, or um, hear what people have to, uh, thoughts people have. I, I, the, the, as um, I think Stephanie mentioned, the by the, uh, bylaw was submitted, delivered to the town council uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday evening. Um, and so Monday. on Monday. Um, and so it's it, it's in process now. Um, uh, but um, obviously there's an opportunity for ECAC to um, um, cogitate on this and, um, and offer any um, comments uh, that we uh, would want to agree to. All right. Questions? Thank you for that, Dwayne. That was a really nice presentation. It really helped me understand. <laughs> Steve? Or, or Tom, go ahead. No. <laughs> Don, go. I, I have to wave my hands every now and then or the lights turn off on me. Oh, Don, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I, all I wanted to say was that um, thanks a lot, Dwayne, and Martha's still here. Thanks, Martha. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you guys did a tremendous job balancing all sorts of interests, um, and you seem to have done it, you know, kind of fairly and, and quite well um, to be able to come up with a bylaw that hopefully will pass muster um you know legally whether or not um one has to get ag approval for it i'm i i did read it through um, since i am a lawyer it's one of the things i did do before um this meeting and um it's really good uh, it's really good um you know most of, a lot of the thing i mean the decommissioning is a big big deal um, it's a big deal with, you know, the oil wells and other drilling out West. I mean, we're seeing stuff now about, you know, wanting to jack up how much money one has to put in as a surety to be able to decommission these things. It's a huge deal. Um, a, a lot of the other stuff is practical stuff that is, is pretty much in any kind of development where a special permit is required, whether it's stormwater control or, you know, how one siting or setback requirements, but I don't want to go on and on, but I think you did a fantastic job, both you and Martha and the whole committee. Thanks, Don. And let me, let me also um, uh, identify uh, as both Stephanie and Christine Restra particularly uh, for her um, leadership uh, uh, and, 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 um, expertise in the actual language uh, and drafting and, and the completeness uh, and, and her her knowledge of of you know all the components of bylaws. The the working group worked very hard in re reviewing uh, and and uh, directing her um, uh, language and so forth. And, and particularly as it came down to some some more interesting uh, portions of it. Uh, but uh, you know, hats off to uh, Christine uh, for for her uh, work on this as well. But thank you, Don. Other questions? The way I advised you on the nexus statements. That's a great idea to try to at least put some legislative history into um, when anybody who has to judge judges whether something you know what public health welfare what that actually means. Um, in, in any uh, in any particular situation, that, that I found that to be great. Also, yeah, great. And the, and the town council advised us on that as well. 
Um, I will say there was um, voluminous <laughs> other materials uh, in the nexus statements that we decided not to include, uh, um, both from internally and from uh, other people. Uh, we sort of ran out a little bit of time with regard to, um, uh, uh, you know, making decisions and editing a lot of language that I, I don't think would have been universally acceptable to everybody uh, on the working group. Uh, but we we tried to hone it in on the on the key areas where we thought um, the AG's office or any other legal uh, um, uh, concerns might be raised, uh, particularly on on you know farms and 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 forests. No, no question. Yeah, pushing it too far could end up blowing up the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. To some extent, you know, less is less is better. <laughs> What's that, architect? Less is more. No, less is a bore. But who knows? <laughs> okay. Go on, Steve. Um, Stephanie, I did have a question. Uh, my understanding is that towns automatically have their bylaws reviewed by the attorney general and cities do not. So if when Amherst passes a solar bylaw, will it immediately become law and then therefore only be subject to challenge by lawsuits in the courts? Or does it, is there a way that the attorney general might weigh in on the law? That's my understanding. Okay. Is that, yes, it, it, uh, because we are, so before the charter, that was our process was that the attorney general's office had to review any of our draft bylaws and now that we are technically a city that is no longer the case so the assumption is cities are better equipped <laughs> i to write don't know what the assumption is i can't speak to this i mean oh, for they, me it's fairly enough. new so yeah. don probably knows way more about this than i do it, 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 yes the answer is it's a fallacy of sophistication i suppose <laughs> um but uh yeah but uh, you know i caution everybody and i know stephanie and uh and town council uh cautioned you all and uh and christine you know taking a look at what the ag does because because they're in this all the time you know taking a look at what the ag thinks meets the threshold of you know protecting the public health safety and welfare and taking that into account is important because you know they spend a lot of time taking a look at that with respect to any potential challenges down the road the it's it's and i know your council does that so i'll leave it at that i think i was going to say that when i was wetlands administrator you know when we were when the commission was dealing with anything, it was just decisions should be defensible. So when drafting the bylaw, you want a bylaw that will be defensible. Yeah. I have a, ahead, Steve. a couple of other thoughts. I've, I've read the attorney general's decision on the Shootsbury bylaw that came out just before Thanksgiving. I have not yet seen the Pelham ones. Um, the, Attorney General in Shootsbury re rejected their bylaw primarily for some reasons that certain maps weren't properly shared as part of the zoning development process. But the second half of the letter to Shootsbury was a series of sort of warnings uh, and concerns raised by the Attorney General about sort of saying, you better watch out, make sure they don't conflict over these points. And these three points in there caught my attention. And it says, um, uh, I'm looking at my notes here that the um, the Supreme Judicial Court, this is, I think, the Attorney General citing the Supreme Judicial Court in the Tracer Lane study um, case, which was the only case on the Dover Amendment and solar that has gone to the Supreme Judicial Court, the Tracer Lane one. It says that the um, whether a bylaw facility violates Section 3, the Dover Amendment, prohibit, prohibition against unreasonable regulation of solar system and related structure will turn in part on whether the bylaw promotes rather than restricts the legislative goal. And in that case, it was referring to the Massachusetts 2050 decarbonization roadmap mm -hmm. that was out at the time of the decision. So that caught my attention. Um, the Amherst bylaw, draft bylaw, by my reading, does not promote solar in any way more than what is the status quo. Rather, it 
builds on a series of restrictions to restrict from the status quo. And that and that worries me um, a fair bit. And I'll, and I'll come back to that in a second. The other thing that I saw in the attorney general letter to Shutesbury was um, a statement they said that the court, and I think this was a, this was the Massachusetts land court they're referring to in this statement, that the court determined that the bylaws stated purpose of the rural residential district, agriculture, open space, and area for lower density single family residential use were legitimate municipal goals, but did not qualify as public health, safety, or welfare. So that one really caught my eye that I, I'm not quite sure how much authority or weight that carries, but it'd be quite amazing if the courts ruled that open space agriculture do not qualify as public health and safety and welfare, at least as far as the Dover Amendment goes. I, I, I'm curious if you, anybody has had a chance to digest and understand that, 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 that's amazing. Thank you, Steve, because I was actually going to ask the same question if anybody knew why Pelham and Shutesbury had been rejected. So this is, you said there were three things or two? I got two out of that. That was two. You're correct. Um, the third thing, um, oh yeah, that they said, the, the attorney general said that um, Shutesbury did not establish in the bylaw that there is sufficient remaining land available for large scale solar installations. And that's consistent with the Tracer Lane. Tracer Lane restricted it to less than one to 2% of total town area. And this decision is saying Shutesbury was similar that they did not show that there was sufficient remaining land available for large scale, scale solar installations if all of the, the bylaw restrictions went into effect. Um, so that also suggests that to be strong, the Amherst solar bylaw should demonstrate that there is sufficient remaining land available for scale solar installations. Trouble is courts haven't said anything about what sufficient is other than 2% of land area is not sufficient. Interesting. So that, uh, yeah, so those are some, I think, interesting questions and not being a lawyer, those things seem pretty strong to me and kind of um, you know, the fact that if op agriculture and open space are not considered public health, safety and welfare, then an awful lot of what's written in those nexus statements in the draft solar bylaw may be for not maybe moot points if the courts would rule, sorry, those are not considered necessary for public health, safe, safety, and welfare. Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't want to get into the weeds on a legal discussion, but, and I don't know that much about Shutesbury or Pelham's solar bylaw, but one of the things I did notice about Amherst solar bylaw is that there are no districts, looking at that chart, there are yeah. no districts in Amherst where solar is prohibited. In it, it, in you can do it in any district. You yeah. just need a special permit. And you know, looking and I don't know whether Shutesbury said, you know, if it's an agricultural district, you can't put solar there. So I don't know if the comparison is the same, Steve. But by by making every district in Amherst available with a special permit, I think that goes a long way to address that issue. I think you're right. And I, I got that sense too, because Shutesbury definitely did restrict it to one out of eight districts, I think. And so there were definite uh, prohibitions in certain districts. And I, I don't know about Pelham, but that was the case in the um, Tracer Lane study as well. There, there was restrictions, yeah. outright bans on solar in all but one or two. And that's a huge, huge difference um, yeah. when, when you get before a court. I think I've said enough. Interesting. Um, <laughs> so I had a couple couple of thoughts and suggestions and um, that ECAC could, could mull over and consider. And I think I would think it would be wonderful if the solar bylaw had some form of encouragement of solar development in town in the appropriate places. And that goes hand in hand with discouraging solar in the most the, the sensitive places that you want to, to save. And by directing solar to the most appropriate places for solar, you can better preserve the places that are best preserved. And so I have some ideas to express on that when the time is appropriate. 
I thought the other thing that would be helpful in the solar bylaw would be an analysis that sort of gives some estimates of the amount of land that's available for large scale solar ground mounted solar developments kind of under two end member cases. One is what's available under the current status quo, the current rules. And then what would be the land available under the most stringent application of an Amherst solar bylaw? Um, so that would kind of give two end members of, of a, a range of land that's a, available and whether it's you know anywhere near the sufficient um, sufficiency as, as the court has used that word. I mean, I don't see that that analysis necessarily going in the bylaw, but as a um, as a contribution of ECAC to um, inform the council and and other parties with regard to the uh, implications of the bylaw. Um, that's something that um, conceivably could be could be uh, could be done in, under the ECAC purview. That sounds like a good idea. I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly that the idea is how much land would be available with or without the bylaw. Yes. Yeah. So without the bylaw how and then with the most, the most restrictive interpretation of the bylaw, sort of the worst case scenario uh, of the bylaw. That was just the way I looked at it, sort of two end member situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, it sounds like the bylaw has some pretty definite things like we could figure out how much land is removed from potential development due to it being um the the protected habitats that you mentioned Dwayne yeah. um, those are not subject to interpretation those are just subject to the lines drawn in the maps yeah other things are subject to interpretation or PGA approval um so that that would require a little bit more interpretation to to figure out what how much in land the, uh, I mean you could look at farmland and say okay well if, it, if it, you, you get less you get less megawatts per acre if you do agrivoltaics than if you did yeah strict uh solar and 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 not have a farm field anymore right yep that would be another way yep. all right um does anybody want to hear my idea for promoting solar yeah oh yeah um the i've been looking at the uh, solar technical feasible study that came out earlier this summer and there's aspects of it that I don't like, but what I think they did do well was come up with a rating system um, for all parcels. It's a, it's a parcel-based system, which is different than the GZA study that the town um, had done, because the GZA was based on a 30 by 30 foot square, and um, the GZA also did not distinguish between ground mounted or canopy or, or building mounted, whereas the technical study for across Massachusetts did they have a specific category for ground mounted. And for every parcel, they give it a score and was it six different categories, agriculture, biodiversity, ecosystems, CO2, which is the sequestration potential of that parcel for absorbing CO2, grid connectivity, and then slope for steepness. And so they give them letter grades a being the best grade for solar development. So an A in agriculture means that land is not valuable as agriculture and would be more valuable or suitable for um, solar. And likewise, biodiversity and A score and for ground mount and biodiversity means that land does not have special biodiversity features to it. A C score, the lowest score would indicate that it has high biodiversity value. Um, so these data are available on an on a online map that you can browse parcel by parcel. And the data are also available as a GIS data set. So you can go through and, and do better analysis on sort of a town basis. Um, so my, my thinking goes along the lines of those parcels that get very high you know, grade point average for these six different categories. Somehow we can relax the restrictions or provide other incentives for solar on those parcels and keep the strong restrictions for the um, parcels that don't score as high as suitable for solar, meaning that they have other better uses like biodiversity um, or agriculture. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That um, well, get get Don's legal sense on that, but <laughs> um, I guess um, 
that was something that we, you know, based on your input, we we did uh, consider uh, and, and sort of discussed with Stephanie as well. Um, and I think on merits that there's something maybe there. Uh, I'm not sure if it goes in the bylaw or something uh, in terms of incentives that are outside the bylaw. I think the general thought was that um, uh, the town wants to look at every piece of land uh, and 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 you know every solar project carefully and thoroughly, uh, and that those those sites that do are being proposed in those you know great great A areas. Uh, are likely um, to get through this permitting process and review committees of conservation committee and all the other committees um, more expeditiously because they are um, lands that are less of concern uh, with regard to solar development. So there's something probably built into the process, not explicit, uh, but sort of built into the process that would um, make those parcels easier. Now, to your point, it's not sort of maybe explicit to promote developers to specifically look at those areas, but they're generally out there looking at lands that are going to cause least trouble for them in terms of permitting. Um, and um, and so maybe there's something, all, all, you know, without explicit um, um, citing of, of, of that uh, technical study maps, which are also, you know, a bit problematic because they're subject to change and um, and the data subject to change. And I'm not sure exactly how granular their data was and so forth, uh, that the town probably would, would not want to give any carte blanche uh, streamlining um, for certain parcels without seeing an application and seeing uh, uh, and then actually doing the site walks and so forth uh, to, to to confirm what DOER's technical potential map said. All right, Dwayne, thank you. I was you. not implying carte blanche for yeah. any any parcel. Okay, let me let me go um, to, I think Don had his hand up and then Stephanie, um, if that's okay. And then we should probably, we only have a few more minutes, 15 minutes left after that, I suspect. So let's move on to the rest of the agenda um, and come back to this again next time. This is gonna be an ongoing discussion. Thank you. You know what, I can Stephanie. pass. Go ahead, Don, rather. No, I can pass. So okay, go ahead, Stephanie. Um, I think I was in. I don't know if Don was going to say this. My only concern would be to be very careful about um, spot zoning, which I don't think is allowed. So I think that's one thing when you're talking about that. Um, I guess in the way that you were describing it, it sounded very specific to specific parcels. Because ultimately, that ends up what you're looking at. So I would just want to be careful about that. I mean, part of the GZA map and the reason why we did it the way we did it was not to identify specific parcels, but areas where solar is more feasible. If we had actually done it by on a parcel basis, we would have come up with very little available area for solar development in town, So, uh, which is why we went the GZA route that we did. All right, Adon Dwayne, are you saying something? Because you're muted. Just to my wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the lips moving. All right. So in that case, why don't we come back to this next time and let's um, move on to. I just had it in front of me, and now I've lost it. Oh, the draft it. letter, uh, which Stella doesn't have ready. So. Right. So that's not ready. But then we have the community climate bank update. Okay. So I did a little more work on that. And I think what I'm going to do, Stephanie, is just with you um, prepare a little note uh, since uh, since um, Laura is at at COP, <laughs> and I think I have a, a idea of what happened finally. So I, I followed up a little bit more to figure out where the climate bank is. This big announcement that was made last June or July by the governor that there's this great climate bank that we can all you know okay, we, that municipalities can make use of. Well. <laughs> I did a little more I, after being sent back to the governor's. It's it's quite funny. It, it's in a it's in a division, some new division of uh, climate innovation and and media mitigation or something like that. Um, that the phone number is the same phone number as the governor's office. So I kept getting people from the governor's office calling me and telling me to call the governor's office at the same number that I had reached them at in the first place. 
So, so I started to get a little suspicious and I looked at what was on the legislative agenda that had the name Climate Bank in it. And sure enough, uh, this was never passed as far as I can tell. So there are two bills in process to fund the Climate Bank and it's in joint committee. And I just today wrote to uh, Joe Comerford and Mindy Dome to ask what is going on with this thing? Um, I don't think it exists. I don't think it's been funded. I think it was just some idea that I, I, it's sort of outrageous what was said in this, you know, advertisement that it was now available and, you know, new program. As, a parent, as far as I can tell, it doesn't really exist at all. So, and it's on the mass housing website too. Uh, but the only information about it is the governor's initial, um, the same announcement. This, you always get sent back to the same video of her announcing this. Everything leads back to that video. So I'm um, pretty sure it doesn't exist yet <laughs> and it should just be on our radar. And so that's what I'm, I'll write a little note, a few lines, just pointing that out that we didn't realize this didn't actually exist yet and that it should be on our radar for the future, but it, it's not there yet. So um, something to- Actually, Laurie, it probably exists. It just doesn't have any funds. No funds. <laughs> yeah. and, nobody, and nobody running it because again, right. phone number is the governor, right? So- it's the same. There's nobody, you know, it has no funding. It has nobody in charge of anything. So, all right. So that's where that is. And uh, next thing, if, unless there are more to say about that, um, the uh, educational series. Okay. So this is important in my mind that we did want to get started on some sort of just some sort of, you know, more, we, we need to be doing more outreach, more talking to the public and uh, so solar in the built environment seem to be the obvious thing to do. Has Does anyone have anything to report on that? Has anyone done any follow-up on that? Go ahead, Stephanie. So I did reach out to Greg Garrison um, right. uh, from Northeast Solar, and he said he is more than happy to do a presentation. Um, January 17th is his uh, availability, the earliest availability. I gave him a few dates and uh, of upcoming meetings, and that was the one he chose. So um, I won't be here for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that's okay. If I, I, I would love, I can listen to the recording. So if we have a quorum, I'd be happy to have him do it on the 17th. Okay. The question is, who's going to be here on the 17th? Right. So we need to find out who's, will you be there? We just have to make sure we have a quorum. Um, so it looks like at least three and um, I, I, I'd be there. Okay. All right. So we probably have a quorum. The other news there is that on the 18th of this month, we're finally interviewing uh, new members of the ECAC. So hopefully we'll have a full committee sometime shortly after that. Can I, Laurie, can I, I'm sorry. Can I just go back real quick? Yeah. Um, Greg said that he's willing to discuss financing um, or how solar fits into the state's renewable energy goals or any other topic that you all see fit. So I would want to have some guidance from you all on what you'd like him to focus on. I told him an hour. I really didn't want to ask him to do more. I mean, no. at one point we had talked about him doing more and I, I feel like an hour is, you know, a generous yeah. use of his funny. time. So my thoughts there, I mean, the thing that I really want to know is, is personally, and I suspect other people are, are in the same place, is, okay, I want to support solar. Um, my house, you know, what is the best way for me to do that, especially if my house is not a good candidate for putting solar on the roof, right? And, and, and yes, how do things get financed? Yeah, what is, how do I know that a company, you know, there are these things you can buy into and there's no way to know what's real and what's not. What are the op what are the legitimate options and how much do I expect to save for, for them? You know, for, for a homeowner. I think that's the first thing for a homeowner. You know, what is available? And then we can talk later also about maybe doing more for, for business owners. Maybe he can do both in one hour. I don't know. Uh, for people who have larger buildings, it sounds like it's a slightly different um, set of incentives and this sort of thing, right? Yeah, we, we, we want him to talk about the financing options too. Yeah. You know, I mean, first there's the question, can I put solar on? If I can't, what can I do? Right. And then if I can, what are the financing mechanisms to do so? And and how much do I expect to, you know, what what is this going to cost me or save me in the long run, right? That's that's the big question I always have. That's what I've been having the hardest time figuring out. Because, you know, if you buy into a solar farm, you end up, I think the result is I end up saving about 10% on my 
<laughs> if I'm lucky on my yeah, absolutely yeah. Um, I would also add to that. Um, so just his an update on this the uh, net metering situation. Yes. Um, where yes. does that stand? Are there bottlenecks in that? Um, I'm uh, is there? I'm I've always not quite figured out whether you know if, if on a personal level if I had solar on my roof and over generated, can I net meter my credits on a personal level to my neighbor? Um, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you can or can't quite I frankly. think you can actually. I think you can, but I, I'd like to hear that and hear if there's been yeah. some experience with that. Um, I know you can't do it across different utility territories, but to your neighbor or to a family member who lives nearby, um, that would be of interest, um, to me at least. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's that's probably. I, I think we want to encourage. That's... I think Steve's brought up or others have brought up. You know, if, if you um, have a roof that can 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 accommodate twenty kilowatts, um, why not put up twenty kilowatts even if you only need ten kilowatts? Um, and 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 uh, and and find a neighbor to work with. Oh, that'd be cool. Wouldn't that be cool? I would be happy to finance one of my neighbors. To yeah, exactly. Help help. Yeah. It's, it's called it's called community. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think that's plenty. So yeah, so, something along those lines for the first, I think would be great. And then um, we don't have a lot of time today, but I would like to brainstorm. You know, what's the next thing, and who would we ask for the next? So this is this is um, uh, Greg Garrison, Northeast Solar, right? Correct. Yep. And then is there a follow-up to this that we want to think about? I just have a quick quick question, if that's okay. Um, and Stephanie, you may know the answer or you may not. Um, you know, what will the effect be, if any, um, if our community choice agricultural project gets accepted um, and approved? What effect, if any, is there on people who are generating solar right now that are sending it, you know, to the grid? Yeah, it won't it won't change it won't change their agreements and their structure of what they've set up. It won't it won't change that at uh, all. So, do you, but, so well, does that mean you have to opt out? I mean, if you're like you me, have to. Yes. you. So when you when the CCA gets established, at least currently, this might change because I know there was some potential legislation that might change it. But right now, people have to opt out of participating in the CCA. And because we can't send our power to the CCA, if you will. It has to keep going where it's going. Right. It's still, and right. So the, and the grid, the utility still is involved in the distribution. Right. So... Okay. That won't change. I don't think you have to opt out, do you? I'm, I'm a little you have to opt out yeah. when the CCA uh, no. gets approved. Right. Anyone who is anyone who is a current EverSource customer has to opt out. If you have a separate structure and you're not going through the utility, I think you would have to opt in. So if you if have you're, something if you're, that if you're getting on. your if you're getting your if you have a an other source. Are, are we talking just about solar people with solar on the No, roof? we're talking you? about you're ta we're talking about your electricity okay. delivery. Okay, okay, gotcha. So this is just this is just about electricity, not about solar. Okay. It's just about okay. electricity. So if, if for, okay. for Don or anybody who has solar that basically balances out their electric grid electric bill over the course of the year, they they would also be opted in automatically to the community choice aggregation and they would but they would just continue to net meter to zero and not really um, um, uh, have any change in their life. <laughs> yeah. uh, but their electric supplier, to the extent that on some months there's energy coming in, would, would be the CCA, but it would be netted out over the course of a year. It's really confusing to me. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. confused. There's going to be a lot That's... of information sessions that are going to be coming up okay. relatively we... soon. Right. So, and... Sorry, I asked the question. I mean, it just. Nope, it, it's, it's a good question. Really confusing. Yeah. 
let's please, since we're short on time, let's please put a discussion of the CCA process on the schedule for next time. I don't think we can yet because uh -huh. it doesn't exist and we don't we don't know what that's going to be. So I, I think it's premature. Okay, but maybe just an update. There was this there was this problem of there was some legislation that hadn't been passed yet, I think, or rules maybe that they were they were talking about. And maybe this is what you're talking about, because I'm still a little confused here about making it an opt in instead of an opt out thing when the CCA came online. That was one of the proposed changes. Yes. And I, I don't know the status of that right now. Okay, maybe we should put I can find status, out status status of CCA opt in opt out on next agenda. Maybe we can get an update on that from someone from from you, Stephanie. I can, yeah, I can talk to our consultant there. Totally on top of all of that. All right, because if there's something that we need to do to pipe in and say, hey, this needs to be, you know, an opt out, not an opt in. These people need to be opted in automatically, right? They need to be in the in the thing unless they opt out. Um, all right. Uh, so with that, we have staff updates and ECAC member updates. I will be quick. Um, so two main things. I submitted the Green Community's annual report, and I'm happy to say that we uh, were 19% um, below our baseline uh, energy uh, usage, um, and which was the goal is 20%, which we were last year, we were at 22, I think 0.5%, 22%. Um, so we have actually gone up in energy usage a bit, but the the overall goal for um, green communities is to be 20% below your baseline. So 19% is pretty darn close. So we're actually doing fairly well, even though we went up, I think that's, um, I think there were a few reasons, but I'm not gonna get into it all now and I have to look into it a little more. Um, so that's one of the things. And then the other thing that I wanted to report out was that I did submit an application for a meta grant for technical assistance to, um, changed it a little bit uh, to look at um, the proposal by uh, Ben Weil and his students on how we can retrofit the town hall. I think we need a little more guidance. They gave us kind of a pathway that we narrowed down, but I think we need a little more guidance um, on that. And also doing anything to the building envelope for the town hall, um, even though I believe Ben felt that there might that that's fairly straightforward. I think given the complexity of the structure, our facilities manager is really concerned. And I think we want to have like another opinion on how we might address the attic space, um, which is very complicated because it's a very, it's all open right now. There's a very thin layer of insulation with a pretty minimal R value um, in the, in the roof space. So um, it would take someone somewhat of a Marvel comic character who could get in there to like <laughs> swing around the rafters and, you know, lay out some kind of fabric and then fill in, you know, with insulation. So we, we have to sort of figure that out, but that's what the technical assistance is going to be asking for is to get, you know, another um, opinion that might actually bring us to a next phase for like a design of both the system and addressing the insulation. Um, so there's more, but I, I'll, we Stephanie, have short on time. And anything we just push to next week. Yeah. Real, real quick, Stephanie, to look at, because we did it in our house, is foam. Mm -hmm. um, if they coat the whole ceiling with foam and then paint it over. It's incredibly good. Yeah, again, I think it's just accessing the space oh, to do that, that, because remember, it's very pitched. And there's a lot of scaffolding and stuff that's up there. So it's not an easy it's not easy to navigate that space. Okay. Um, let's move on to ECAC member updates. I have one if no one else does. Um, I just wanted to say that I have finished the Rewiring America um, heat pump advocate or elect electrification coach program, their beta tested version. And I, if assuming my schedule allows next semester, I will actually be participating in the facilitation of their next session in January and February, but it depends on, it, it all depends on their uh, timing. <laughs> um, Congratulations. So if I, if Did I don't you get do a badge? It, I don't have a badge. They didn't send me anything yet. They said they would, 
but, certificate? Do you get a certificate? I, yeah, I'm supposed to get a certificate, yeah. but um, I haven't gotten it yet. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm actually very much looking forward to doing this in the future, if not, if not this semester, because I, it's been just busy. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say. Is there anyone else? Other member updates? If not, we open it to public again. Martha, Martha has her hand up. Just so hey, Martha, my, you can go ahead and uh, unmute. Sorry, Don. Just so my notes are clear, since 10 is items for next meeting. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We've been sort of going through them as we've been along. We had the uh, status of the CCA opt-in out, out on the next agenda. We had uh, the letter, uh, Stella's letter on idling. Yeah, um, we're going to continue talking about the solar bylaw. Finish that discussion. Um, yeah. And was there anything else that I missed? Yeah, I'm going to finally get you something on pace. Yeah, not a problem. And, okay, and pace and maybe the uh, solar just maybe the educational series just nail that down, get an update on where that is, and start yeah. making flyers for it. Thank you. That's it. I think that's it. I'm sure we'll think of other things <laughs> in the course of the weeks. Um, all right, go ahead, Martha. Okay. Thank you, Don. I, I just, you know, can't resist making a few comments then about the solar bylaw, right? Having suffered through it along with Dwayne for <laughs> too many months to count. <laughs> but so um, a few things. I felt that we really were trying to make, encourage uh, the use of solar on farmland. Um, you know, it was June 9th. I had to look back. It was Ju our June 9th meeting when we had the panel of experts come uh, and talk about the uh, uh, dual use on the agricultural land and about the uh, smart incentives and so on. And I must admit that I got really jazzed about it. And I, I felt even though the section looks like it has a bundle of requirements, really the requirements are not meant to you know, push the thing away. They're really meant to kind of encourage and help and uh, you know, here we are in Amherst with with the technical assistance from UMass. It seems like a great opportunity uh, to take advantage of it and to help encourage uh, the 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 solar on the farmland. And after all, you know, farming really is an important part of our local economy. I mean, you think about the farmers markets and the uh, all the uh, people who buy shares for the summer and. Um, so on. So I felt that that was something really positive. Steve, in answer to to your thinking that we didn't really encourage solar, um, I don't know, maybe we, we didn't say enough, but I thought we were <laughs> doing it. Regarding forests, you know, there really, there really is a change in thinking over these past few years, you know, as we experience climate change, which means, you know, alternate droughts and floods and you know you've seen the deluges we had this summer that really impacted farmland and Hadley at least and so on there's a, a real change that I believe is part of the health safety and welfare of our residents and that you have to have uh, what one would call climate resilience or you know think about what are the things we need to do on our land to help protect from floods basically or other things and that Certainly forests play a big role in that. And point out that right on our town website right now, there's an announcement about an EPA grant to help our community um, <clears throat> develop nature-based uh, resilience uh, in the face of climate change. And, you know, go read it. Nature-based to me means, you know, you have to look at your open lands and see uh, what we need to do in terms of climate resilience, and that really is part of health, safety, and welfare. So the, the forests are, you know, they have roles in, in many different ways that we have to consider. Um, some a few other things to, to say about that. If you look at the GZA public report and other surveys that have been done, of um, the public and you know, asking homeowners, would they put solar on the roof? And if yes, why? And if not, what are the drawbacks? And the thing that comes across the biggest is the upfront cost. It's just way out of everything else. You know, people often say that, yes, the reason they want to do it is for the sake of the environment. 
And to some extent, they say yes to save money, but it's the upfront cost that's the problem. And so maybe that's something that the ECA could think about. And I know, Dwayne, you had mentioned about the, um, <clears throat> the credit union uh, that, that gives low cost loans at this point. And uh, maybe other banks could be convinced to do so if the town really you know, launched a campaign or, uh, you know, but I think what I'm saying is we need to think about the reasons people are resistant and see what we could do about it on, on that score. Also then about, you know, what lands in Amherst are appropriate. Don't forget about the niche report. That was the previous report and survey of Amherst of what lands would make sense to put solar on. And they talked to focusing then on the built environment, on the many parking lots, on the uh, land that was barren or not very good, you know, like that gravel quarry up there on Route 116 South that I guess is in Amherst, or uh, Steve, you know, that 17 acres that, that um, Hampshire College owns and so on that uh, is mentioned in the niche report. So there really are areas to think about, and and parking lots uh, are are really uh, a really good future thing to think about. Right now, the problem is the financial incentives, but I know the schools are thinking about it, and um, it's something to consider for the fu for the future. Okay, um, and Martha, I'm gonna thank you, yes. and I think we have to go because yes. I'm yes. done. Because I know yeah. Don has to uh, go and and um, right we won't right have a farm so, at that point. Thank, so, thank you all. Yes, <laughs> I really appreciate your input on all of this. So thank you very much. Yes. Well, you know there will be further discussions. I'm I'm sure. So okay. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. <laughs> all right. So with that, knowing that Don has to go, um, and we're all exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you all in uh, in two weeks. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sounds Bye. great. All right. Everybody be well. Yep. Be well.